I was supposed to be dead. Whatever it was that I was able to fight off, I don't know if they'll ever really know why I didn't die. Like, this is all bonus time. My name is Mark Goldberg. I, I'm almost 65. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, Los Angeles, and went to film school and I'm a TV editor. Growing up, you know, there weren't any gay role models. There wasn't Pete Buttigieg, presidential candidate. We didn't have gays in the military. There was a TV show called That Certain Summer with Hal Holbrook and it ended with a close-up on his face. He's lost everything in his life and he's crying. So that's what gay was. Taboo. I remember when I was, I was probably 14 or 15 and walking to school with my friend and he showed me a photo of a man and a woman from a nudist thing. It wasn't sex or anything like that. It was just outdoors and they were both just standing. I think they were holding a watermelon or something. And I remember seeing this photo of this naked man and my knees started shaking. It was a visceral reaction. It affected me. And uh, I remember once I went to uh, a friend of mine's Sweet 16 party, a, a girl that I've known since seventh grade. And uh, there was a guy, and I didn't realize I was flirting with him. He was a little, I was just chatting and he was friendly. And when we were moving from the dining room to another room, he grabbed my butt. Although I had a very, very strong physiological reaction. Oh, holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, uh, but uh, when I was 18, I, you know, I was, I was dating women actually from before 18. Uh, but I think I had my first sexual experience with a woman at 18. And, uh, but also uh, I had an experience with a man at 18. And I thought, well, I got that out of the way. I don't ever have to do that again. But <laughs> it didn't go away. So I just told myself that I was bi. And I did have girlfriends and was with women and all that. But I had this other side that I didn't really talk about. So I went to Cal State Northridge for my first two years and UCLA for my second two years for film school. But back in UCLA film school, there was a guy who ran the operation, all the equipment and everything, a guy named Ben. He was my first official gay friend. He had a partner, Bill, and I became friends with him and I went to Yosemite and backpacking trips with them and ski trips with them. And they were my first real gay friends. They were great guys. When I was 23, I went to work on a cruise ship. I was away from everyone I knew. And I thought, well, okay, I'm going to be able to figure this out now. I was a good looking 23 year old kid. And there were these beautiful, 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 beautiful women. And they wanted to be with me. And I just was like, I just don't think I can do that anymore. It's like, I guess I'm gay. But when I did come out, I was very angry with my father and it was really due to his alcoholism that I was reacting to and, and all the shit that that brought. If I could do it different, I would. But they got over it quickly. And, and then when I came back home, a couple months later, I met a guy named Gary who became my partner. Laguna Beach at that time was this magical mystery place. They had the gay beach, West Street Beach, and there was this bar called the Boom Boom Room. And it was like Gilligan's Island. It had the bamboo. It was just a wonderful escape. And Laguna was a magical place and it's an art community. And I, I had been seeing someone who lived down there. So I'd go down on weekends, but I I'd already decided this guy is an asshole. I'm, I'm pretty much done with him. I'll just see you through the weekend, and but I'm not going to come and see him anymore. One of the things I do in my workout is I'm a swimmer, just for exercise. And I guess I'd seen Gary on the gym floor, and he came up to me and asked me how the chlorine was. And I said, well, it feels okay, but I, I'm wearing goggles. But he was just trying to make conversation. We chatted some. And he gave me his phone number. And so Gary told me that he knew that I was not a game player because I didn't wait a few days. I called him at 9.05 on a Monday morning because I knew that he was, uh, he was something. 
we had a great first date, which I remember we saw Victor Victoria. And it's also a great gay first date movie. And the girlfriend who I had, I, I said, you know, I think I might have met someone. And she said, now, if you really like him, make him wait. Don't give it up right away. <laughs> <laughs> so I made him wait till like the fourth date. I already knew that we were going to have great chemistry because we had this attraction. So I thought, there's no rush. Let's get to know each other. This is, this is right out of the gate. So it wasn't just a, a physical or a sexual thing. It was, we were, we had already established a, a great rapport and friendship and, and all that. He was four years older, four years older. So I was 23 and he was 27. He had a few more miles on him, you might say. I mean, I wasn't, you know, brand new, but I was pretty new. And he'd already been out and had a lot more experiences than me. I think he was waiting for me to say, I love you first. He loved me so much. It was like unconditional. And I felt the same way. And someone once asked him uh, if he was like jealous because we, you know, we'd go to the beach a lot. That was our thing that, you know, people in their 20s do. They go to the beach. Uh, and I talked to other people and someone said, do you mind that Mark flirts with other guys or talks to other guys? And he goes, no, he always comes home to me. <laughs> <laughs> so he would, there was never any jealousy or any, like I had jealousy issues. And I remember once I was like, I was like spinning out of control in my own little made up world of panic or what have you. And he like made me sit down and talk to him about something. And he was good at making me communicate. And uh, we were on a trip and he was with Two of his exes that were, had, they had all been roommates, but they had all gone out and they had such great rapport and they were such beautiful men. And I was, I was really jealous. So I kind of disappeared and he found me and let me, me sit down. And I said, well, why are you, these guys are so much better looking than me and they're so much more fun and you're having such a great time. And he said, Mark, I, I know them. I've gone out with them. They're great guys. I love them. They're my friends but they're not who I want to be with. I want to be their friend, uh, but I want to be your partner. You don't have to be jealous. We're just friends. We have a history, but it's you who I'm, you're the person that I want to be with. So that was like a big life lesson because it taught me like, don't like, you know, you got to communicate. And it turns out I was spinning out of control over absolutely nothing. I was just a matter of communicating. My parents, my brothers, my grandparents, they all really liked Gary because he was a really great guy, very likable. He was very kind. He was handsome. And his folks, they adored me because I think they had seen other people that he had been with. And it's like, oh, we love Mark. He's like so much better than these other people he's been with. And they knew that Gary was really happy with me. So... I loved his family so much. I was totally part of their family, just like Gary was part of my family. I didn't know this at the time, only in retrospect, but my grandmother pulled me aside and she said, Mark, of all the friends I've ever met of yours, I like Gary the best. I really like him a lot. I, I didn't know what she was telling me, but she was telling me, I know Gary's your sp special friend. And I really like him. They all were crazy about him. And as a matter of fact, when they got older and couldn't do things, he would stop at their house and do their bills and their paperwork for them. <laughs> so, you know, because he loved them and they loved him so much. And actually, there's this ring, this my, uh, family ring, that my great-grandfather, who I named for, designed and everyone in the family guessed when we were 21, and they had a ring made for him because wow. he's part of family. Yeah. So it was really nice. Gary at first was really reluctant. Well, we had been together five years, but we weren't living together. And he said, aren't you concerned? I said, we've been together five years. We're going to live together fine. We already know each other. It's not a problem. And we bought a real fixer-upper, but it was a good location, good bonds, and, you know, good deal. We just knew we had to do a whole lot of work. 
And at first, Gary didn't have the vision, but something clicked. And all of a sudden, he could do electrical, he could do plumbing. You know, I did like hard labor and I could do drywall and I could paint, but he knew how to do more complex stuff. And we fixed up like five or six houses. Yeah, that was that was a, a thing that we did. And I think if he hadn't gotten sick, he would have gotten into real estate because he loved the transaction and the business part of it. He took to it so well. We stopped going to the beach and all of the fun stuff on weekends, and we're just fixing up houses and building our little empire and building, you know, a future. This is might have been 82 or 83. Uh, my uh, The medical practice, was, there was a gay medical practice named Pacific Oaks. And at the Gay Pride Festival, they had a setup, and we had this doctor named Bruce Osher, who was... 27, a young, young guy. And we saw him at, uh, at the festival at the, at the Pacific Oaks booth. And we said, Bruce, what is this thing that we're hearing about this gay disease? What's going on? This is before anyone knew anything. And he said, he said, guys, we don't know what it is, but I think when you go to the gym, you should wear long sleeves and long sweatpants because I think it's transferred through sweat. They didn't know anything. This was before. There was just some mysterious illness in San Francisco and New York before the phrase grid or arc. And then I think it was in 86 is when they came out with a test. They, they knew it was a virus and you could get tested for it. And Gary did not want to get tested because he knew that there was no cure and he could not live dealing with knowing that he had this life sentence, that he had this terminal disease. But our best friend, a guy named Mark Coleman, went and got tested and he was positive. So I thought, well, I'm going to go and get tested because I know that I can handle knowing and I want to know. Uh, and I was positive. But then uh, he had gotten recruited to be in some study where they were taking plasma and he said that they're only taking plasma from HIV positive people. So that's how he found out because the doctor was too stupid to really explain things or even ask him, knowing that Gary didn't want to know if he was positive or negative because there wasn't anything that they could do about it. And I feel like I had to have gotten it from him because A, he was four years older, had a lot more experience. And sometime within that first year that we were together, I was probably zero converting because I got... Uh, a high fever for five days and couldn't go to work. And that never, ever happens. Like if I ever get a fever, it's maybe a hundred for a couple of hours. But five days in a row and missing five days of work, that was never, ever something that would happen to me. So that has to have been when I was serial converting. It was after I met Gary. So, so I've probably been positive since 1982 or 83, which is like 40 years, 40 years ago. Um, so I'm a long-term survivor. <laughs> so with Gary, I remember hearing this horrible sound, and that was Gary throwing up. And that was the beginning of his infection with cryptosporidium, which it's a parasite. You have constant diarrhea. You cannot hold anything. He lost 40 pounds. And, you know, he had to go on disability. And it was a nightmare seeing him deteriorate and waste away and lose all that weight because he was a big, strong, beautiful man, big, strong, beautiful man and waste away where he, I had to even wash his hair in the sink and we could still do things for a while. Like there were still a, a few trips that we could do and we'd go see his family in Boston and we did a couple fun trips. Mom and dad took us to Sedona but, you know, I look at those photos and he's losing more weight, more weight, more weight. There was no cure for or proper treatment for uh, cryptosporidium. And, and then because it had weakened his system so much, he started getting KS lesions and being so thin. So th there was this show, Roseanne, and it got to the point where the only thing that Gary could do 
is sit up in his bed for half an hour to watch Roseanne. That's the only thing he could do. And friends would come over just to watch Roseanne with Gary because they knew he would be up and alert and could laugh and be with him. But that was it, a half an hour. And, you know, the doctors, he'd been in and out of the hospital all that time, and there was nothing that they could do. I remember there was his birthday dinner, and he couldn't get out of bed to come. His parents were there, my parents were there, uh, other family. He could get out of bed to join us for his dinner. And they, we all knew it was his last birthday. He died when he was 38. And it took me a long time to stop blaming myself because I thought, oh, if I could have only made him eat this or that or this or that. But he, he died in um, 1993 and the proper drugs didn't come out till 96. So at a certain point, I had to just say, Mark, you couldn't have stopped him. It was three years before people died of AIDS. It was out of my power. No matter what I might have made him eat, he, you know, it was three years before the right meds came out. Well, I'm kind of still re recovering, to tell you the truth. Um, but uh, yeah, it was really hard. If, if I didn't like him or love him or something, it might have been easier. But we had a really, really, really good relationship. So it was hard. I was uh, HIV positive. Luckily, I didn't have any, any of those other illnesses, just the low T cell count. So many people, like our friend Mark Coleman, they thought, well, we're going to die. And so many people just burned through all their money, started using drugs and alcohol. I was really focused on trying to eat healthy, trying to exercise, trying to get enough sleep. All the things that they said to do, I did. All the things they said don't do, I didn't do. Maybe that helped me. I don't know. Because other people... Uh, did that and they still died. And um, and some people partied and went crazy and all that, and they're still alive. So, you know, they don't know if it's like the, the genetic strain that I had or my body was just more capable of fighting it. They still don't really know. But I made it. I think Gary, from his diagnosis to his death, was a year and a half. After a year and a half, part of the healing is just to be with someone who's like healthy and doesn't need a zillion medications and not dying. And a lot of times people would like say, you know, Mark, I really like you, but I just don't think I can build a relationship with someone I know is going to die on me. And I'm not kidding. That's what people said to me. Well, in 96 is when they came out with a cocktail. Some people still didn't make it, but plenty of people who were much more dead than living, were brought back from the very, very edge. Well, psychologically, that, that period was really difficult. And I, was, I went through a very long and very deep and very bad depression for way, 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 way too long. Luckily, I, I started painting. I took one year off after Gary died to do a series called Gary's Greenhouse and Garden. He always wanted a greenhouse, and I had one built for him in our yard, when he got diagnosed so he could have orchids and do what he wanted to do while he had this time, while he was dying, he could at least commune with nature and orchids and flowers. And so I did a series of 18 paintings, portraits of these plants. And who doesn't love that? And they were Gary's plants. It was a hit. I got a lot of publicity from it. APLA did greeting cards that were a, a part of a fundraising package, and Gary was a client of APLA. Thank God I had painting to help me express all of this grief and turmoil, which I put into my paintings. And, you know, I had a successful 11-year run as a full-time artist, and I had galleries, art reps, and it was good for me to have that creative outlet. So I wasn't in any kind of self-destructive patterns. I had my painting, and I threw myself into that emotionally. You know, it wasn't just one death. It was just death after death after death after death. And eventually, I, like, stopped having suicidal ideation every fucking day for decades. But still, you know, I throw myself into a, a job where it's 
10 hours a day, all consuming, and I just have enough time to go to the gym or maybe see a friend, but it's still something I really struggle with, but it's much, much, much better. One thing I'd say in retrospect to what I survived, of course I have gratitude. Like so a lot of people who rejected me because they were afraid that they were, I was gonna die on them, they've died of other things like cancer. Or, and so I, I feel it's important to educate people. Uh, for many years, friends that might not hear from would contact me and it's because they became HIV positive and they knew that I was coping and dealing and thriving. So they would talk to me and I felt like it was a big responsibility to be able to help them deal with it. You know, I think for a great relationship, you have to have that crazy chemistry thing, mutual attraction, best friends, you know, mutual support, uh, know how to uh, support each other uh, emotionally, be able to understand and bring out the best in your partner and uh, make each other laugh, all those things. And we had all those things. And we had a really great relationship.